Hello, my name is Lynn Stevens, and I'm one of the curators at the Museum of Childhood in Edinburgh. That means I have the lovely job of looking after the museum collections and learning about what it was like to be a child in the past, and then telling everyone what I've learned through talks, exhibitions and films. I'm going to talk to you today about some of the toys and games we have in the museum's collection, and what children your age might have experienced in the years from 1945 to the year 2000. So we'll be looking at children and play from around 20 to 75 years ago, when your grandparents and parents were children. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about how children got their toys and games. It has only been in the last 20 years that people have been able to shop online for toys, games and books. In the time we're looking at, children would have been taken to big shops with toy departments or ordered things through the post by using a paper catalogue, like the one you can see here. This one is from a large department store called Gamages, and this catalogue dates from 1965. Toy catalogues can tell us a lot about what children were playing with and how technology has changed and what was available to buy. Gamages was a large shop in London, but you could order their toys from anywhere in the UK by sending off an order by post. Edinburgh had lots of large stores with toy departments, such as Jenner's and Forsyth's on Princes Street. In these catalogue pages, we can see some more traditional toys that children would have been playing with already for many years, such as tea sets, puppets, dolls, bikes and pedal cars. Dolls were certainly not a new toy, having been around for hundreds of years already. But what was new for the dolls you can see here is that they are made of plastic and they're also wearing the latest fashion. Earlier dolls would have been made of wood or wax or china. Perhaps you could choose a year and design some clothes that a doll might have worn at that time. You might not think it's unusual for the female doll to be wearing trousers but women very rarely wore trousers until after the Second World War and during the war in 1939 to 1945. It became practical for women to wear trousers to work on farms and in factories, which is what they were doing while many men were away fighting. And after the war, they just carried on wearing them more and more as they are practical and comfortable. But before this time, women always wore dresses and skirts. We can see in the catalogue the introduction of electronic games too. In the racing car sets, an electric train set. There is also a brownie camera. Remember, this is long before we all carried cameras around in our pockets on a phone. These cameras had rolls of film that you put in, and after you'd taken about 20 to 30 photos, you had to take the roll of film out, take it to a chemist shop, and then have it developed into prints. Now let's look at some toy cars from the 1950s and 60s. Cars had started to be seen on the roads in most towns by the 1920s, and by the 1950s, many families owned one. Small metal toy cars started to be made in the 1930s, but they were their most popular in the 1950s and 60s. You can see a selection here, and as you can see, there were many different types of models. You could get a tiny version of a racing car, a tractor, a bus, or a fire engine, or just about anything and play with them on the floor or in your garden, making up as many games as you liked. The most popular makers of these toy cars were called Corgi, Dinky, Metoy and Matchbox. Matchbox toys were called that because their first cars were small enough to put in a matchbox and carry it around in your pocket. The inventor of the toy had a daughter who was only allowed to take a toy to school if it was small enough to fit into a matchbox so he created a whole range for her. Corgi cars became a favourite with children as well, as they introduced clear plastic windows and headlights and gave their cars opening doors and bonnets, so there's more features on the cars that you were playing with. The other image you can see is a Scalectrics motor racing set. This was a very popular game in the 1960s and 70s. You built the track and placed the cars on them, and then you pulled the trigger on a handpiece and the cars whizzed around the track. The harder you pushed on the trigger, the faster they went, so you could have an exciting race with two cars and two players. You had to be careful though, because if you went around the corners too fast, the car would go flying off the track in a spectacular crash. Although sometimes this was the most fun bit. 
Most children would have spent a lot of time playing outside. They, they may have played imaginary games that needed little or no equipment, much as you do today, chasing around, playing tip or hide and seek, hula hooping, kicking a ball or marking out hopscotch on the pavement. They also played with skipping ropes and sang rhyming songs. Two toys that most children would have been familiar with were roller skates and bikes. These metal roller skates are from 1950. Each skate has four rubber wheels and you wore your shoes while you stepped into the skate and strapped them on with buckles or laces. They probably weren't very comfortable, but you could probably go quite fast on them or hold onto the back of a bike and get pulled along. By the 1970s and 80s, roller skates had become roller boots, which you put on like a pair of boots and laced up, so you didn't need to wear separate shoes. We now also have Healy's shoes, where the wheels are built into the shoe themselves and you can choose to walk or roll along. Bikes had been around a long time, but it wasn't until the 1960s that most children owned one. It was quite an expensive toy to own, so you would have been bought one as the main Christmas or birthday present. The design of bikes stayed mostly the same, but in the 1970s, the Rally Chopper bike became extremely popular. It had a very different design. It had high handlebars that were supposed to make you feel like you were on a motorbike as you leaned back in the long saddle. The long seat meant that two children could potentially be on it at once. The chopper also had a three-speed gear with a gear handle on the frame of the front. It was considered to be very cool to own a chopper bike at this time. It was the very latest fashion for bikes. Increasingly after the Second World War, children had to think about road safety as more and more traffic came onto the roads. Before then, there would have been vehicles pulled by horses and electric trams in the centre of big towns and cities. There still would have been a lot of traffic on the streets. But from the 1950s onward, children playing in their streets in smaller towns and villages would also have been very careful about cars. Children were taught about road safety in schools. You could join the Tufty Club, created in 1953 by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents. Young children learnt in schools about being safe near roads. There were Tufty storybooks, comics, board games, handkerchiefs, jigsaw puzzles, stickers, colouring books and even soft toys of the Tufty Squirrel. By the 1970s, there were two million children in the Tufty Club and the Green Cross Code was introduced in schools and on television adverts with the instructions to stop, look and listen when crossing the road. Both this scooter and skateboard in the museum collection are from the 1970s. I expect you will be familiar with both of these toys. Scooters for children had been around a long time already, before the 1970s, and there hadn't been too many changes to their design. You can see this blue one has a brake at the back that you can put your heel down on, like many of the scooters you can buy today. Skateboarding, however, was a new, exciting pastime for children in the 1970s. It was first invented by surfers in California, America in the 1950s, but only really became a global movement from the 1970s onward and really became fashionable for children to have a skateboard. To play in the street, you didn't necessarily need a fancy bike or a skateboard though. If you look on the internet for something called The Singing Street, it is a film of children playing in Edinburgh on the streets in the city centre that was made in 1951. They are singing songs and skipping with ropes and perhaps you will recognise some of the games that you still play now. Now let's look at some of the dolls which were popular in the 1960s and 70s. The baby type of doll in this image is a self-wetting doll made from plastic in 1960. You put water in her bottle and then when you fed her with it, it came out the other end in her nappy. Dolls that looked like babies and behaved like babies were very popular and still are. So children can play by pretending to look after the baby, bathe it, change its clothes and feed it. As plastic became more advanced, it was used more and more in children's toys. The metal dinky toy cars were replaced with plastic ones and dolls were too. Plastic fashion dolls like the one in the middle also became very popular at this time and still are. This is a Cindy doll, very much like a Barbie doll from the 1960s. This exact doll was in the 1965 toy catalogue we first looked at. She is dressed in her casual weekender costume with blue jeans and a striped red, white and blue jumper. Lastly on this slide, we can see a homemade doll 
made from a simplicity sewing pattern. This one is what was called a holly hobby type of doll. These were very popular dolls in the 1960s and 70s. The doll in the books that were created for Holly Hobby always shows the girls wearing loose dresses made from rags and patches and a large bonnet worn on the head, pretending to be from a much earlier time. This one was made in 1976. These are just three types of dolls, but of course there are many more types of dolls in the collection. In addition to dolls, the museum has lots of soft toys and a lot of them are characters from books or television that you may recognise. This first bear in his distinctive red top and yellow check trousers was made in 1968. He's Rupert the Bear and he is a character that is much older than the 1970s. He first appeared in a newspaper comic in 1920 and since then has had his own books and television shows. Paddington Bear is another bear who started life in print in the books written by Michael Bond. And then more recently, there have been some very successful films which you may have seen. This Paddington toy was made in 1987, which was soon after a popular te television series was run on the BBC of Paddington Bear. In the 1970s and 80s, there were only three television channels to choose from, so any children's programmes would have been seen by nearly all children in Britain, as they were the only ones you could watch. There weren't even videotapes until much later in the 1980s. Here Paddington Bear wears his usual duffel coat and hat with a label marked Darkest Peru to London. Please look after this bear. Lastly on this slide we can see a 1990 hand puppet of Gromit the dog made famous by the Wallace and Gromit films such as A Grand Day Out and A Close Shave. Maybe you also have toys that are characters from television programmes or films. We might have some of the same ones as you in the collection. Most of the toys we are looking at are from quite a long time ago, so that you get an idea of what children played with in the past. But the museum also has recent toys that are still being made. Buzz Lightyear and Woody are both characters from the Toy Story films, the first of which came out in 1995, but you can still buy these toys. This Buzz Lightyear doll has a red button that you press, and he says lines from the film, such as, Buzz Lightyear reporting for duty. And Woody also has buttons on his guitar, so you can press for him to talk. Talking dolls are not just a recent invention, although the quality of the recordings has got much better as technology has developed. The first ever talking doll was invented by Thomas Edison in 1890, over 130 years ago. To make the doll talk, you had to turn a handle on the back of the doll, which made a wax disc turn around and play the sound. You can find recordings of these old dolls on the internet, but they do sound very strange. Here is a picture of the Groffalo from the books by Julia Donaldson, now also made into films. This toy was bought by the museum in 2005, along with a soft toy of the clever mouse who managed to avoid being eaten by the Groffalo in the stories. Toys from films are not a new idea. The cinema was at its most popular in the 1930s, nearly a hundred years ago. And from the start, there were toys and games and books that were made associated with these films that children could play with. In 1977, the first Star Wars film was released, and these action figures are from that first film. There have, of course, been a series of Star Wars films since, and you might have a favourite one. The Star Wars films produced lots of toys and merchandise, and lightsabers have always been a particular favourite. A very popular television series in the 1980s was He-Man and Masters of the Universe. It was an animated series set on the planet Eternia with He-Man as the hero fighting the evil Skeletor. He-Man lived in Castle Greyskull and fought with his sword of power, which we can see in these images. The figures in the castle were the must-have Christmas toys for the early 1980s child. Since the 1970s, there's often been a particular toy that's become the most wanted present due to advertising on television. In more recent years, it's been dolls from the film Frozen or the Pie Face board game, and of course, the latest Xbox or PlayStation games. And yes, the museum does have computer games in the collections, which I'll tell you about shortly. There are quite a lot of different companies that have made very well known toys over many years. When I was talking to you about toy cars, I mentioned Corgi, 
Dinky and Matchbox. Lego is another very successful company who has essentially been making the same toy, the Lego brick, for over 80 years. Fisher-Price toys were manufactured from the 1930s, like Lego, which were created around the same time. The Chatterbox phone and record player shown here are in the museum collections and are both from the 1980s, but they had already been popular toys for children for over 20 years. The Chatterbox phone is still available to buy and even appeared in the Toy Story 3 film. Fisher-Price are especially known for making toys for younger children, which is why they have bright colours and large easy-to-hold pieces, rather than small fiddly parts that might be difficult for a toddler to hold. So far I've spoken about games played outside or perhaps on the floor with dolls and cars and action figures. However, board games and other games you can play with at a table with other family members or friends are also a large part of children's play. Adults like to play them too, and they've been made for many hundreds of years. Here you can see a range of table activities, jigsaw puzzles, board games, and that you move around with counters like Snakes and Ladder or Monopoly, but also games like Kaplunk where you use marbles and sticks. Sometimes the games are purely for fun and sometimes they can help children to learn, such as Scrabble, which can come in a junior version to help with spelling skills. I have already spoken about the influence of movies and television on what toys were available, but music also had a big influence. Here you can see a book about Elvis Presley, shown on the cover, who was incredibly famous in the 1950s and 60s as a rock and roll singer. He sold millions of records and appeared in films. The other image is a pop quiz board game. Pop quiz was a television program in the 1980s hosted by Mike Reed, who was also a Radio 1 DJ. This is the kind of game that would only be available to play for a certain number of years, but then the information would be out of date. New bands and singers would come along and nobody would know the answers to the questions anymore. However, games like Monopoly and Scrabble can be played for years and years and years without any changes necessary for the players to be able to understand the game and play it. Although plastic has been around for a hundred years, most toys would have been made from wood or metal until the 1960s, after which time plastic became the main material used. I'm showing you a few examples here. A My Little Pony toy from 1985, a Rubik's Cube, which was a huge craze in the 1980s, and stickle bricks. I suspect most of the toys you have at home will be made from plastic, and it is a great material for making all sorts of shapes, and it can be strong and colourful. In museums, lots of conservators have discussions about how to make plastics last for a long time before to stop them deteriorating, as we want to be able to show future visitors the toys. However, for the rest of the world, the concern is how much plastic is used and that it doesn't deteriorate fast enough. Perhaps in the future, plastic will be used less often in toys, but we shall have to wait and see. Children have always expressed themselves through imaginary play and drawing and painting, and toys have been invented to find new ways to create art. The Sketchomatic, seen here in 1965, is a toy that allows you to draw on a screen. It isn't an electronic screen, though. The makers tried to make the Sketchomatic sound exciting by saying you could draw by remote control and use a magic eraser. However, it simply works with powdered metal on the inside of a screen, which you draw the lines in and then smooth away to clear the screen again. The Spirograph was a geometric toy, a series of plastic wheels that if used together could produce many different patterns by placing a small wheel inside a larger one and putting your pen through the holes and rotating it round and round on the paper. Finally, I wanted to show you some of the electronic toys that are in the museum collection. The museum has a number of these toys showing how they evolved through the development of the microchip and computer games. The grandstand football game is a handheld battery operated game and shows Kevin Keegan, who was a very famous footballer of the 1970s and 80s. It was a very simple technological toy, really, with a ball lighting up and moving slowly across a screen. The Spectrum ZX was a home computer that was launched in the early 1980s, and you could buy games on tape cassettes. These were before floppy disks or compact disks, known as CDs, were invented. Our most recent computer game is this 2002 Xbox console, which is already 20 years old, 
so we have some catching up to do. Just like board games, the same computer games are often played by both children and adults. I'm sure you've probably played some computer games with your parents. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about some of the toys in the museum collection. Perhaps you could use some of the ones I've shown you to think of ideas about making your own toys or games, or write stories about the children who may have played with them. Thank you for listening.